Recently, I had an online interaction, on sort of an online discussion, if you will. I had posted some material about the spring holy days, and a person out there responded, and they were commenting on it, and they basically brushed everything aside and said, oh, well, come on, what are you talking about? All that was settled at the Jerusalem Conference in Acts 15. And this is a very common way of saying that God's Sabbaths, the Seventh-day Sabbath, and the Holy Days are no longer to be taught and promoted as the outworking of godly living by God's people. So I have a question, and I want to answer it. What did the Jerusalem Council decide? What did the Jerusalem Council decide? The Jerusalem Council was a was a meeting of church leadership that was convened sometime between 45 AD and 55 AD, sort of like what we do with the GCE. And that meeting was called, it wasn't like a regular annual meeting, but it was called on an ad hoc basis to settle some doctrinal disputes that were related to the inclusion of non-Jewish people into the church. And a brief report of this council, this church council that happened way back then, and the decision that they came up with is found in Acts chapter 15. You might hear it called the Acts 15 council, the Jerusalem council, so forth, but it's recorded in Acts chapter 15. As I mentioned, the Jerusalem council of Acts 15 is very often presented as a turning point in church history in which supposedly a very distinct break was made with the principles of teaching obedience to God's law. The Jerusalem Council argument, which I encountered online just last week, is very often trotted out to justify abandoning the Seventh-day Sabbath and the annual Sabbaths that we call Holy Days. And it's kind of just plopped out there, and as the as the person that I was in dealing with said, well, that just settles everything. Our purpose today, my purpose with this message, is to demonstrate that the council's decision recorded in Acts and the discussion that they had leading up to it was limited. And it was limited to defining the role of circumcision in God's formation of a special assembly of people which would be composed of both Jew and non-Jew. And it was not written to address the entirety of God's commands, judgments, and statutes. Let's take a look at the context and the setting, the brouhaha that caused this meeting to be called and convened. Well, the reason for calling the conference was to settle a doctrinal dispute, which had first flared up in the city of Antioch. Antioch was a town about 300 miles to the north of Jerusalem. It went up the coast, almost at the southern border of the nation called Turkey right now. And uh, it was a very large, vibrant congregation of, uh, of the church. And it was in a very large, vibrant, cosmopolitan town. And the church was doing all kinds of great work in Antioch, proclaiming the message and drawing people to the truth. Both Jews and Greeks and native peoples that were there. What happened was Christian teachers who had formerly been Pharisees came to the city of Antioch from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was sort of the... Uh, headquarters church, you know, like home office for us, if you will. So these guys came down, Christian teachers, and they had been Pharisees before. They came to Antioch, and as we'll see later, they, they weren't sent by the church. They just went on their own volition. Now, I don't know. They probably had heard about the positive news of what was going on in Antioch, and they wanted to make sure, I suppose, that the folks up there were doing things the right way, you know, the Jewish way, the, the Jerusalem way, the Pharisee way. I don't know. But they went up there and uh, they caused no small stir. Go to Acts 15 and uh, verse 1. 
It says, but some men came down from Judea. It says come down because Judea was like geographically higher on their, like a mountainous area. So they came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, they, uh, <laughs> they got into a dispute. These self-appointed teachers had said, basically, they came to Antioch and they said, You're doing this all wrong. Non-Jewish people have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And this brought them into dispute with the two of the leaders there, Barnabas and Paul, who basically said, no, that's not how it works. Now, the fact that they were from Jerusalem probably lent weight to what they said. I mean, people, you know, said, oh my, they're from Jerusalem. There must be something to what they're saying. They, they were making an impact in the congregation. Perhaps that's why. Paul, however, Paul knew better. Paul knew better. The only way that they were going to settle this, the dispute was to go back to Jerusalem and get a ruling. Now, when it comes to Paul, I said he knew better. Well, let me explain a bit why. This gets into the context. This gets into the setting. Paul was a team player. And I say that... I don't, because sometimes you hear people talk about Paul and his relationship with the other apostles as a bit confrontational and that uh, he really set a totally different direction from the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the, the apostles and disciples. Uh, no, Paul was a team player. Before he ever went off to preach and teach up in the northern areas where he was, Paul had met with the leaders in Jerusalem. And he had made sure that they were all on the same page doctrinally. To get the background for that, go with me to Galatians. All right, Galatians 1 is where we'll take a look. Galatians 1. You might want to put your a little marker in Acts 15. We'll be coming back to that. But Galatians 1, verse 18. Now we pick, we're picking up the story here. Paul's telling a bit about who he is and where he's coming from and he's we're picking up the story after he had had his damascus road experience he'd been struck down he'd been um sent off he'd been kind of rehabilitated uh, by god and baptized and so forth very dramatic very interesting story we're picking up after that it says after three years so after uh kind of missed a step there paul after his damascus experience he was baptized he was you know he had an encounter with the risen Jesus Christ, he went off into the desert for three years to be taught. I missed that part. Picking up in verse 18, it says, Then after three years, after this three years of instruction from Jesus Christ, Paul went to Jerusalem. It says, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Peter, Cephas, and remained with him for 15 days. So he spent over two weeks with Peter. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. So he's saying, I'm telling you the truth, people. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, up to the north, where Antioch is. Basically, it kind of says it right there. Paul had a 15-day long meeting with Peter at the very beginning of his ministry, before he even went off anywhere. Now, we're in Galatians. Let's, let's follow up with this, okay? Take a look at chapter 2. Paul goes on, talks a bit more about this. In Galatians 2, chapter, uh, sorry, Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, he says, Then after 14 years, so some time passed, he's been up in the north doing his, doing his thing, preaching, teaching. I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, okay, and taking Titus along with me. And I went up because of a revelation, and I set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential. So he had a private meeting with the leaders of the church up in Jerusalem. Anyway, 
going on, he says, I set before them the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. So this is a private meeting that Paul had convened with the leadership in Jerusalem to make sure that he was on the same page doctrinally. This was, as it says, 14 years. So I think that's about 10 years after he had gone up to the northern area. And uh, then he comes back down, talks to them about what's going on in, in Antioch and Syria and so forth. And uh, circumcision definitely appears to be part of the discussion. He was there talking about the same issues. If you, I'm not going to do it right now, but if you go and look at what's being addressed in the book of Galatians, it's the same issue. It's circumcision. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is that Paul was not charging off on his own to teach uh, his own thing, which was contrary to what the other churches, other congregations of the Church of God were doing. He was working in cooperation with the leaders of the church, with an approved message and practice. That's what he related in the book of Galatians, those sections that we just read. Anyway, back to the Acts 15 scenario, okay? Let's pick it up in verse 3, Acts 15. Off to Jerusalem for an official ruling. So they're headed off to Jerusalem. Now let's pick it up in verse 3. So being sent on their way, so this posse went off to uh, get the resolution. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared that all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said again, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So they've headed on back up to Jerusalem, and the case has been laid out. Okay, these guys are teaching the wrong stuff. They need to teach people to get circumcised. The accusation is put on the table. Now, when you when you read that, there's a, I don't know if this really makes it a whole lot of difference, but I believe there are more than one way that you can interpret verse 5, which I, I think is a, a very important verse. Uh, which says, but some believers belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Uh, w one way you could, you could read that, and it's more a matter of emphasis, if you will, is uh, you could read it, you need to circumcise them and also command them to keep the law of Moses. Or you could interpret it as, um, well, you need to circumcise these people or teach them circumcision and thereby keep the law of Moses. It's a very subtle difference, but I think it, it does kind of, the nuancing of that does shade the way you interpret the rest of what's going on. Either way works, though. I mean, my argument is not contingent upon emphasizing it the way I emphasize it. All right, moving right along, we'll pick up the next section, which is basically Peter and then Paul and Barnabas testifying before the council. So they are laying their case out on the table. Acts 15, let's read verse 6 through 11. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth, Peter's mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their heart by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test 
by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Peter's referring to his own personal experience with the calling of Gentile people, non-Jewish people. He's speaking of the conversion of the Roman centurion, Cornelius, and Cornelius' household, his family. That Gentile household had received the life-giving deposit of the Holy Spirit, even though they were uncircumcised. And that occasion was marked by signs and wonders, which were provided by God to prove that this was indeed his will for the Gentile people. Let's just take a brief look at that in Acts 10, okay? And let's read verse 44 through 48. Peter's preached to the household of Cornelius, and you know, at the very end of his message, it says, While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, so the Jewish members of the church, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptism for these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked him to remain for some days. Let's just finish it off by reading Acts 11. We'll follow up a bit on this, okay? Acts 11 and verse read verse 1 through 3. Following up on this experience that uh, Peter had with the household of Cornelius, it says, Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. And so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the uncircumcision party, that would be the same kind of people, you know, the Pharisees who were giving Paul all that trouble up in Antioch. So when the circumcision party criticized him, saying, Peter, you went to uncircumcised men and you ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them. So he started walking them through what had happened. Now drop down to verse 17 and 18. If then God gave the gift, the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they, all the others in Jerusalem, heard this, they, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So this is the incident that Peter is referring to. So th this had happened a few years before. They've basically gone through all this stuff, and Peter's referring them back to that. You know, at the council, he's saying, remember all this stuff. We went through this with Gentile people before. Okay? And that's what he's talking about. Now, there are a couple of theological points embedded in there. One is the concept of salvation. Now, remember the, the critics here, the critics up in um, Antioch are saying, well, salvation is not possible without circumcision. These self-appointed teachers said circumcision is necessary for someone to be saved. Well, the truth is that a person is saved from death through repentance and acceptance of Jesus' atoning sacrifice. But a necessary second step is the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the receiving of the deposit of indestructible eternal life. That's the real deal. That's what's really, really important. That's the active presence of God's Holy Spirit in them. And that was the, you know, that's the core of Peter's argument by referring back to what happened previously with the household of Cornelius. The real deal, the real proof is the receipt of the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting about what Peter does with the household of Cornelius is that, uh, they, you know, they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, first of all, he doesn't say, well, let's, they've received the Holy Spirit, let's circumcise them. <laughs> they didn't say that. What did they say instead? He said, they've received the Holy Spirit. Wow, God has done this, and it's been, uh, signs and wonders have, have accompanied it, 
It's shown us that this is indeed God's will. He commands them to be baptized. So this non-Jewish household of Cornelius, back in Acts 11, received the life-giving gift of the Holy Spirit without having undergone the rite of circumcision, but then followed up immediately with baptism. It's an interesting point. Um, God still works through rites and ceremonies. God has rites and ceremonies, you know, things, actions, physical actions that we do. Uh, they're, you know, the spiritual reality is taking place behind them, but the physical act of baptism is still a rite, if you will, a rite of passage, if, if you will. And uh, God uses rites and ceremonies to mark special occasions. Under the administration of the new covenant, baptism replaces circumcision. Baptism replaces circumcision. It's a change. It's a change. Like the, you know, I've gone through this before with, with, with messages where the priesthood was changed in the new covenant. The sacrificial system was changed. They weren't done away with. They were changed. Well, circumcision has been replaced with baptism. And baptism is now the outward sign of inclusion in the people of God. Let's go quickly to Colossians 2, verse 11. Colossians 2, verse 11, and let's read verse 11 and 12. Paul writing here says, In him also you were circumcised without the circumcision... Sorry, blah. <laughs> Let me try that again. It says here, In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. That's a key scripture. And that is uh, basically telling us that circumcision is replaced by baptism as the sign of um, I don't know, the declaration of intent, the, the sign of the new covenant. Uh, I don't know, those aren't precise terms, but you, I think you get the drift. All right, let's go back to Acts 15. So I've, I've spent this section there explaining, well, what was Peter referring to? He was referring to the previous incidents that they had had, he had had personally, with the conversion of Gentiles and them being included in the church. Okay, now the next section here in Acts 15, let's pick it up in verse 12. All right, verse 12. Barnabas and Paul are going to testify. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James replied. All right, so... We don't get a lot of detail about what Paul and Barnabas said, but uh, basically they're using a very similar argument to Peter's argument, which is, first, okay, there were baptized Gentiles in Antioch, all right? And two, these baptized gentle Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit of God. And three, that God had clearly ratified the change and the change in procedure through signs and wonders. Uh, that was brought out in the testimony of Paul and Barnabas. Signs and wonders had accompanied what was going on in Antioch, where they were not circumcising Gentiles. Those signs and wonders were a way in which God was proving, yes, this is my will. He'd already done it in Acts 11 with Peter, but Paul and Barnabas are saying, no, the same thing's happening up in Antioch. So their argument is very much the same. So the next person to get up and speak at the council meeting is James. James. And James kind of acts as a moderator, if you will, and he proposes a settlement to this whole issue. All right? Let's pick that up. Uh, well, first, let me, let me just go over what it is. All right? I, want, I want you to think about what he's really saying, and then I want to read through the scripture. So James... Basically, he affirms Peter's testimony, which is that God is calling Gentiles into the Israel of God, which is the, the church. 
you know, the church is now the holy nation and the chosen people of God. And it is to be composed of all peoples and all nations, not just Jews. And then James goes on to refer to one of the many prophecies which foretell this change in administration. And we'll read that, but he's quoting from Amos chapter 9, verse 11 through 12. James then goes on to make a proposal, gets down to brass tacks. He goes on to propose that they pass a resolution and that they confirm it in writing, saying, Gentiles do not have to undergo circumcision. However, he goes on, there's more. <laughs> However, they do have to continue observing other regulations from the law of Moses concerning, specifically, concerning Gentiles who choose to live peaceably among the people of Israel. And those regulations that he refers to are regulations that are found in Leviticus chapters 17 and 18, part of the holiness code, the law of Moses. And then finally, in verse 21, James calls upon the law of Moses as a justification for making this resolution, saying, in effect, everybody knows what the law of Moses says on these matters, since it is preached to people on a weekly basis. And with that, I mean, that's kind of my executive summary or well, paraphrased summary. That's better. My paraphrased summary. So rather than doing away with the law of Moses with this last statement, the council through James are actually justifying the content of their resolution by appealing to the law of Moses as validation. Now, now that I've told you what to expect, let's read it. Let's take a look at verse uh, 13 through 21. It says, after they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles, that's Peter, to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And this is his quotation here. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who make these things known from of old. So he's referring back to this prophecy from Amos. And then he goes on, verse 19, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in their synagogues. So this is what James proposes. Now I mentioned the four regulations from, Gen from um, Leviticus, the four regulations required of Gentiles. Let's take a look at those. I want to just do that, just so you see that this is definitely referring back to the law of Moses. Go to Leviticus 17. We won't go through every last inch of it, but in Leviticus 17, let's take a look at this. Uh, let's take a look at food polluted by idols, okay? It says in Leviticus 17, verses 1 through 8, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel, and say to them, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. If any one of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it as a gift to the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guilt shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood, and that man must be cut off from among his people. This is to the end that the people of Israel may bring their sacrifices that they sacrifice, that they're currently sacrificing, out in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord, to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall throw the blood on the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and burn the fat of the pleasing aroma to the Lord. Verse, this is important, verse 7. So that they no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons. So, so they stop sacrificing meat to demons and idols. After whom they whore. And this is to be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. 
And you shall say to them, Any one of the house of Israel, or of the strangers who sojourn among us, who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice, and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from his people. So this is a law that says even people who were just visiting in Israel, not Jews, not Israelites, people who were just passing through, travelers, maybe migrant workers, they had to obey this law. Let's take a look at um, the, the other one that James mentioned, eating of blood. Okay, eating of blood. Drop down to verse 10. It says, If any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among us or among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among the people. Then he explains, because the blood is the life and the life is the essence of the sacrifice. Um, okay, so I'm going to just paraphrase that. Let's take a look at the next one that James may, mentions. And notice that the eating of blood that we just we just went through is for the sojourners, not just the Israelites. Even people visiting in the country had to do that. All right, meat from strangled animals. That's interesting. Uh, take a look at verse 13. Verse 13 of Leviticus 17. It says, Any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them who takes in hunting any beast or bird that that uh, may be eaten, so if they you know get clean game, like a deer or something like that, they take this clean animal in hunting, uh, or a bird that may be eaten, they shall pour out its blood and cover it with the earth. Right? For the life of every creature is in the blood. And if you don't do that, God is very, very angry. So this is another rule that is for sojourners, as we read. And... Um, James says meat from strangled animals. Well, basically what he's talking about is uh, animals who are killed so that they still have their blood in them. And, you know, <laughs> there was a time when people did that. They would kill an animal by strangling it so that none of the, none of the blood drained out because they wanted to eat the blood. They wanted it in the meat because it would make it um, more protein. I don't, know. I don't know. I've never tried it, so I don't know what it tastes like. But uh, the example in Leviticus 17 is talking about um, wild game. So non-sacrificial animals who do not have blood drained from them. That's a no-no. God says, no, you don't do that. And this is something even for Gentiles. All right, one last one, okay? Leviticus 18. Now, I'm not going to read Leviticus 18, but if you read it yourself, verses 1 through 30, it's all about sexual immorality, all right? And it, you know, and it says basically that people, you can't have sex with family members, you know? can't have sex with your grandchildren or your uncle or your aunt or your daughter or your mother or you know all kinds of stuff like that and also there's a few other things you know animals but it's talking about this kind of sexual perversion and in verse 26 it says okay but you shall keep my statutes and my rules and do none of these abominations so god says don't do this bad stuff either the native so you israelites or the stranger who sojourns among you. For the people of the land who were before you did all these abominations, so that the land became unclean. So those are the four regulations that James is talking about. And uh, these are laws of cleanness and holiness for Israel, which even sojourners, travelers, migrant workers had to observe if they were in the land of Israel. So a non-Jew, you know, even if he was there temporarily, he had to do these things so that he would not defile the land. But, you know, people like that, by comparison, they were not expected to participate in the um, religious life of Israel, right? Uh, a person like that, a sojourner, a traveler, someone who's passing through, a migrant worker, was not expected to observe the Passover, for example. Uh, if if someone wanted to observe the Passover, they had to be circumcised. If someone wanted to participate in the religious life of Israel, they had to go the whole nine yards. They had to be circumcised and thereby, you know, enter into the covenant. Uh, you can read that little stipulation there in Exodus 12, verse 48. I'll let you do that on your own, okay? So circumcision had been a sign of inclusion in the holy nation 
and the covenant people. It changed, though, because under the new covenant, that sign was changed to baptism. You might think of it like the changing of the Passover symbols. The symbolic lamb of the Old Testament Passover is changed to this symbolic bread and wine of the New Testament Passover. Okay, let's get back to Acts 15. Acts 15, and we'll pick it up in verse 22. The church passes their resolution. Verse 22 and verse 23 it says, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent Judas, called Bersabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. Okay? So they, they had a letter. They wrote it up. They wrote this resolution. They proposed it. They formalized it in writing, and what they were going to do is they were going to send Paul and Barnabas back to Antioch with the resolution in writing, which would settle the matter. And they also included two witnesses from the Jerusalem area to testify and verify that the letter was, was legit, you know, so that Paul and Barnabas couldn't be accused of trickery. Let me read the resolution for you. What did they write? Okay, verse 24, 23, I'll pick it up in 23. So with the following letter, the brothers, both the apostles and the elders to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Syria and Galatia greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from among us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. So he's saying, OK, some people came. They you know they might have come from Jerusalem, but we didn't send them. It seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these requirements." that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols from to abstain from blood and from that which has been strangled and from sexual immorality if you keep yourselves from these things you will do well that's the letter that's the letter it uh, starts off referring to the controversy that precipitated the decision you know, it's separate. It kind of says this this wasn't from us. Then it identifies the witnesses who will be coming along to verify that the letter's legit, and then it renders the decision, which is actually only two verses long. Two verses long, which is basically saying no to circumcision, right? Concerning the matter that came to us, it's a little, a little bit tangential, but uh, it's no to circumcision, no to circumcision yes to the other regulations which are related to cleanness and holiness before god which is required even for gentiles interesting isn't it let me make an appeal to to reason your reason and if you've ever heard this argument if you've ever thought about it perhaps been confused by the letter um, hopefully the context and the setting has has helped see what the letter is but let's let's just think about this reasonably some say that the resolution that we just read, recorded in the book of Acts, formalizes the abolishing of any and every commandment, statute, or judgment found in the Old Covenant. Except, uh, of course, uh, idolatry, eating blood, and sex, <laughs> perversion, sexual perversion. Well, frankly, folks, that is a teaching of lawlessness. It's a false teaching. I, I know you know that, but it's a teaching of lawlessness and it's wrong. First, that interpretation, you know, that takes it as a declaration of abolition of all things commandment related, commandment statutes, judgments related. Really, that broadens the scope way beyond what these guys were talking about. They were talking about circumcision and the role of circumcision in the, sal in, the, in the process of salvation for the non-Jewish world. That's what they were talking about. Second, that interpretation, you know, that this resolution just does away with everything, settles everything. Well, it, it absurdly proposes 
that all the commandments, judgments, and statutes found in the law, out of all, all the commandments, statutes, and judgments, these four are the only ones that really matter. Not eating blood, um, abstaining from meat sacrificed to idols, and sexual perversion. Well, using that kind of logic, you know, since the letter says nothing about lying or stealing or honoring parents, covetousness, well, then those things don't matter either. It's just illogical, as most teachings of lawlessness really are. Third, let me give you another one. This false interpretation of the meaning of this resolution from the church in the book of Acts this false interpretation depicts the Jerusalem Council as supposedly rejecting the law of Moses, the entire law of Moses, but also at the same time calling upon the law of Moses as a form of validation for what they resolve. It's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. That's my appeal to your reason. Okay, so why was circumcision done away with why, why did the church get rid of circumcision why did god change it why was circumcision dispensed with well look the first and the most compelling reason is that because god said so <laughs> god said so that's a pretty good reason and uh, he verified the the change of administration with signs and wonders he backed up what was going on by Miraculous events that proved, yes, this is my will. That's your first most compelling reason. But there's more, okay? There's more. Circumcision is for Abraham's family. That's what circumcision is all about. It, it is, a, it is a, uh, a thing for Abraham's family. Circumcision, I think everybody knows what it is. I don't, I don't want to go into all the gory details. But circumcision was a physical mark made in the flesh, the removal of the male foreskin, which signified a covenant between God and all the physical descendants of Abraham. And God promised things to the physical descendants of Abraham. He promised to greatly increase their numbers. You know, your children will be like the stars or the sands of the sea. He promised to give them great physical blessings. First and foremost, the promised land. And that he would enter into a contractual covenant with these descendants, which, which happened at Mount Sinai. So circumcision is for Abraham's family and Abraham's household. And it signifies a covenant and a promise that is not available to anyone outside Abraham's bloodline or household. And that leaves out the vast majority of people on the planet. Go back to Galatians. We're done with Acts 15, but let's go back to Galatians. Galatians is really about the same issues. It gets into more of the reasons why, though, the theological reasons why. Galatians 3, verse 5. Let's read verse 5 through 9, okay? Which says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, In you all nations all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So within God's promises to Abraham, there's this reference to something bigger. And that something bigger comes through the Messiah. Go down to verse 16. Verse 16 of Galatians 3, where it says, Now the promises, he's referring back to this this. Uh, the first, re the first promises that God made to Abraham. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. You can read that in Genesis. 
The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. But it does not say, and to offsprings. Not, it was not plural, but referring to, sorry, it does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring. And that offspring is Christ. What Paul's getting at is he's saying, the promise that God made to Abraham, that all nations would be blessed, would come through the Messiah, the Christ, who would be a physical descendant of Abraham. This descendant of Abraham would be a blessing for all peoples, not just the bloodline of Abraham. And at the appointed time, through Christ, God would initiate the new covenant. A covenant which all people would and could enter into. Jews, Gentiles, you know, Greeks, Romans, Lithuanians, <laughs> South Americans, slave people, free people, males and females. It was open to everybody. And the basis, the basis of their inclusion in the new covenant was faith. Faith. What is faith? Well, that they would hear and that they would believe and that they would do. That's what faith really is. To hear, believe it, and do it. And those people, people who do that, such people, they would be considered the true children of Abraham, the spiritual children of Abraham. As Jesus said to the Jews, you know, when he was talking to them, you know, they were very pleased with themselves because they were physical descendants of Abraham. And he said to them, if you were children of Abraham, you would do what Abraham did. But you don't. You can read that in John 8, verse 39. Abraham had faith and he acted on that faith by keeping God's commandments, statutes, and judgments. That's what God says about Abraham. And in, you know, there's more to him than that. In, in matters of the heart, he was, he was um, another man after God's own heart, I think. He practiced justice. He practiced mercy and faithfulness. And those things were always, have always been, God's purpose, God's intention. God's true desire. Go back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy verse 10. Even when talking about circumcision, way back, Old Covenant, God wanted a change of heart and mind. Deuteronomy 10 verse 16. Way back in the Old Testament, Pentateuch, Law of Moses, verse 16. Deuteronomy 10. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and no longer be stubborn. God wanted a change of mind, change of heart. That's what he was looking for. Another one. Go to chapter 30, verse 6. Along the same lines here. It says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and that you may live. A change of mind, a change of heart, repentance, <laughs> has always been the real goal. And it still is. Now, the sign of that change of mind is baptism. Under the terms of the New Covenant, the sign, the outward sign, just as circumcision was meant to be an outward sign of inward change, well, baptism is the outward sign of inward change. What God wants to see is the inward change. Yes, God works through rites and ceremonies and special occasions and so forth, but what he really wants from each and every one of us is a change of mind and a change of heart. He wants us to become like him, become different. And, uh, you know, baptism, well, it's the sign of a, a new covenant for everyone. 
Everyone who repents, everyone who has this change of mind, everyone who becomes a true spiritual child of Abraham, the sign of that change of mind is baptism. For everyone who repents, who believes, and allows God to write his laws on their hearts and on their mind. And that is what the resolution of the Acts 15 Council was about. That's what they settled. 